For one thing about the guitar, it's always a handy instrument to have around. The reason why the guitar works, I think, is because I can make all sorts of crazy noises with it, as well as play uh, really peaceful sounding stuff. No matter what you play on the guitar, it sounds great. They're just great instruments. They're great, the guy that designed the guitar, some caveman somewhere, man, or whatever. Great design. You know, stick with string and something hollow here is great, man. What a great idea. <laughs> In October 1991, this auditorium in the Spanish city of Seville will host one of the greatest ever gatherings of guitarists to celebrate the fact that the electric guitar in the last 50 years has come to determine and shape the popular music of the 20th century. This event is part of Expo 92, a massive celebration of culture and science hosted by Seville. Phil Manzanera, Roxy Music's guitarist for 10 years, is one of the event's musical directors. To me, Spain is the spiritual home of the guitar, and the flamenco guitarists were the first guitar heroes. This makes Seville the perfect place for this event. I'm sure the players will be inspired by this, and by the presence of each other to produce some great music. It's about time somebody came up with this idea. I'm really excited to look forward to uh, everybody's going to be on their toes, you know, because it's, everybody's playing the other's instruments. Just watching a couple seconds of John McLaughlin, I'll be able to learn something, steal something, you know, you know or BB King. I want to just be there, and when we say cock my ear on them. I want to see what it is that they do that make it sound so good. But I've got a chance to experience their playing and and enjoy them and steal some things from them. I always borrow, you know. <laughs> They're gonna be able to see history, the history of music, uh, the last 50 years or so or more, displayed right in front of them. They've got a good selection of, of guitar players there. So I better get a good night's rest before I walk in with those guys. The electric guitar is very much an American story. It's the story of an instrument born out of necessity when the rural bluesmen migrated to the cities and needed to be heard in their new urban environment. But once amplified, the acoustic guitar became a whole new instrument. Les, they just won't fit, that's all. Well, why don't we get your mind off of it and let's do How High the Moon. <laughs> Les Paul, a popular jazz player throughout the 40s and 50s, was one of the first to see that the electric acoustic was the beginning of a new world. Les, now 76, plays every week in New York's Fat Tuesdays. On an acoustical instrument, one note would resonate much louder than the next note, one would sustain longer than the next one, so it was not consistent. And so uh, the first thing I want to do is get something uh, that was reliable, that you could make two of them, make them sound alike. It happened in 1941 when I told my friends I was going to go over to the Epiphone factory and make a 4x4 log 
and here it is right here and I would just I would just string it up and try it and I tried it and I says this is the answer to all the answers to this thing my backyard in California was full of uh, uh, a lot of talented people one of them being Leo Fender and old Leo was looking at this thing and he says what are you going to do with that log and I says well I'm trying to convince Gibson Leo says you know I'm thinking of making one of these things would you like to go with me on it and I said no no I'll stick with Gibson I'll convince him sooner or later Gibson didn't take the solid body guitar very seriously Late in the 40s, when Fender introduced the Telecaster, which was the first production solid body, after Fender started to sell quite a few, Gibson began to pay closer attention. At that time, they went and found Les Paul again. Les had, had a solid body design that Gibson had rejected, saying, we'd never produce anything like that, it's just a plank. At that point, they said, let's go find this man with a broomstick again. <laughs> So the Les Paul guitar was born, and I said, I want that action way down low, and I want this, I want that, oh boy. And it was tough for Gibson. So a lot of gray hairs up at Gibson. Until you will, I still my heart. When Leo Fender started making the solid body Fender guitar, and it came out really big. And that solid body guitar started a whole new world. I mean, it was it had a great sound, a great effects. And then Les Paul came out with his guitars, his solid body guitars, which created a whole different sound, different market. The guitar became the largest selling item we had in the store, where before it used to be trumpets and trombones and saxophones and bass fiddles. Now it was electric basses and it was solid body guitars. In the years before the advent of the solid body, the electric guitar was already proving itself as a virtuoso instrument in the hands of its first playing genius. Charlie Christian, Benny Goodman's guitarist in the early 40s, was giving the guitar a voice that would transform it from rhythm to lead status. Charlie Christian's success caused really an immeasurable change uh, in that there were people, they heard Charlie Christian, and they say that when they heard them, they lost their minds. And I think they don't mean it, you know, maybe literally, but they became obsessed with that sound. Previously, maybe they liked the guitar, maybe they were playing acoustic guitar, but hearing that electric sound changed their lives, got them to pick up electric guitars or put pickups on their acoustic instruments and start wailing. When I first heard his recordings, I knew he was something special because then nobody else was playing like Pat. But his tone was also excellent. And I noticed that after that, nobody else ever really came up to that sound that he had. I think guitar players are still trying to get the sound that he had. And, and I don't know how he got that sound, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Charlie Christian was to jazz, T-Bone Walker was to the blues, drawing from both jazz and country to create his own smooth sound. These diverse styles would inspire young players like B.B. King, who would mix it up and add his own earthiness. Walker would play, he would bend the strings like
like that. Charlie Christen had a way of playing that we hear it in many people, but he would use uh, diminished chords in a lot of cases playing tunes which would sound similar to this. <laughs> like that and oh. so I like uh, I still can't do it but that's what he was known for doing another one was Django Reinhardt now Django was a French gypsy they tell me and he would come like and you'd hear this guitar seemed to sing and then, like that. When I'm playing now, the BB King that everybody knows, I can't hardly help but. He was one of the great popularizers of the electric blues. When the rural bluesmen went up to Chicago, and it was following a whole black migration in the States uh, of, of people looking for work in the North after they left the farms, B.B. Uh, King epitomized the idea of the black electric guitarist in the blues band, which is what a, that's all a rock and roll band is. It's, it's an amplified version of the rural blues. By the mid-50s, these rural blues had evolved into something new and exciting with the addition of driving rhythms and short, catchy solos. These would provide the soundtrack for a social revolution and the blueprint for a vast new industry. Well, I'll tell you one little secret. I play the guitar as if I had a drum. I wanted to be a drummer but I couldn't get this hand to leave this one alone. You know, I, it, this one tried to do with this. I played drums a little bit, but I, I'm, on, I'm limited. And so I used the guitar, the same licks that I put on the guitar, I would like to do as a, as a drummer. <laughs> I'm the sucker that invented that scratching thing, you know what I'm saying? See, like when you... supplied the rhythm and Chuck Berry the guitar licks, access to a lucrative white audience hungry for this new sound was not easy. At that time, we had that kind of a mess here in America. You know, okay, can you find a white dude that can do it? Then you don't have to do it as good, just do some of it and share this cat back over here. And that's what was happening, you know. Well, they said you was high class. Well, that was the line. Yeah, they said you was high class. Elvis Presley put the guitar into the popular consciousness. Elvis Presley standing around on TV and shaking his hips and uh, banging the guitar once every 32 bars or so. Uh, it was a real potent image because first of all, if a guy's just standing there singing, then sometimes he can look a little corny, let's say. Uh, if he's even holding the guitar, it looks like he's part of the band, like he's doing something. And being part of the band was always real potent in rock and roll. Every group comes into the store. Uh, there's not one famous musician except for Elvis Presley who never walked into the store. We had to deliver stuff to him at the Waldorf once. He needed a bunch of things, but he never, he was, I guess he was very shy. Rock and roll 
was now the music of youth, and the guitar was both its symbol and its means of expression. While it was America that set this guitar revolution in motion, it was England, at the beginning of the 60s, that turned it into a phenomenon. The Beatles put together some of the Elvis Presley idea with the, the idea of groups like the Shadows, the guitar group. And, uh, and just as with Elvis, the iconography became so incredibly potent. The Beatles meant so much to everybody that then everybody had to have guitars. I like the guitar because, uh, you know, it was just basically it was a cool instrument. I mean, everybody in my neighborhood got guitars when the, when the Beatles came out, and so, you know, I followed suit. But then after that, I mean, I found it was a pretty nice way of expressing yourself after I got into the players that I decided to listen to. Several things made the guitar popular. One, I would think that it was easy to carry around with it. Two, with the amplification, it made a lot of noise. People liked a lot of noise. Three, they saw all these famous musicians making so much money playing the guitar while they didn't see it doing playing the, the saxophone or the trumpet, because the big bands were really gone by then. See you strut up and down the floor when you're talking to me. That baby talk, I like it like that. How, 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 how. As the Beatles were defining the popular face of the guitar, a large British audience were tapping into the American roots of the music to people like John Lee Hooker. Out of this emerged the British blues. Groups like the Yardbirds, the Rolling Stones, and Cream then re-exported their version of the blues back to the United States. All of the bands then were just doing that. Right? They were trying to recreate, uh, you know, uh, the American blues thing, but, but I think the difference between us and them was that we wanted to make our own statement. Uh, we wanted to express our own thing, write our own music. Uh, in, in fact, it, it worked because then the, the Americans heard that and they were interested in that. And I remember playing with, uh, with Muddy Waters and Otis Spann, and they were playing our versions of, uh, of their tunes. <laughs> So, uh, you know, work, I guess. England and the English somehow see the treasures of the United States a little more clearly than the people in the United States do themselves. The bluesmen experience a revival of their careers in England, not here. Here they became passe, in a sense, because their natural audience, the black community, moved past them. When I first went to England, I read a piece in the paper where Eric Clapton had said that it was his first visit to America, and one of the things that he enjoyed most was meeting B.B. King. That was a great thing for me. 
because a lot of the people that knew he was a superstar has been listening, superstar rather, and been listening to him. Uh, you know, they came out to see me, to see what was he talking about. So that was a great big lift for me. Clapton related to the blues in a way that is mysterious because he was a, a middle-class English kid and yet seems to have been very common. For some reason that we'll find out when we get to heaven, Eric Clapton and Keith Richards and John Mayall and a lot of other young English kids found something in common with this rural black American music from the southern plantations that, w that was 20 years out of time when they heard it. This British-driven guitar music meant boom times for Gibson and Fender, who dominated the guitar market for the next decade. Meanwhile, black America had moved on from blues to embrace soul music. For soul music, the guitar was not an icon, but was an important supplier of color and phrasing. I'm gonna wait till the midnight hour. If there's anything to be said about the stack sound, it, it really was uh, music with licks in it. We like to call them money licks, you know. A song that becomes a real national hit record is identifiable within its working parts, whatever it is. But a funny little, uh, <clears throat> little thing that happened with me uh, in writing a song, um, I came up with an intro uh, for a song with Wilson Pickett that went like this. I'm gonna wait. Wait till the midnight hour, which there again, when you start, by the time you get there, everybody in the audience knows what you're going to play. I was working with Eddie Floyd one night, and uh, we wrote a, a pretty neat little song called Knock on Wood. We were having trouble, uh, you know, getting an intro for it. And I sat there, and all of a sudden it hit me, I don't know why it hit me, to play Midnight Hour intro backwards, which went. Therein lies an example of how <laughs> something so simple can become so identifiable, and, and I always refer to it as follow the dots. And if you know anything about guitar, it's marked with these fret markers called dots. And uh, <laughs> they're on the top side as well. And you just follow the dots and you can't get into trouble, you know. Folk music was the last to hold out to the lure of the electric guitar until Roger McGuinn and the Birds showed what could be done with a Dylan song and an electric 12 string. I was interested in um, getting an electric 12 string, so I took a pickup and put it in my acoustic 12 string, but it didn't quite have the sound that I was looking for. And around 1965, the Beatles came out, 64, 65, and I was really interested in the, uh, the sound that they were getting. So I went to see George Harrison playing a, a Rickenbacker in A Hard Day's Night, and that's what gave me the idea for the Rickenbacker 12. At the time I heard the Beatles, I was working uh, as a songwriter in the Brill Building, which is a famous uh, Tin Pan Alley in New York City. And my job was to listen to the radio and emulate the songs that I heard. And when the Beatles came out, I was doing that. So uh, naturally, I jumped right into that kind of music and started mixing uh, folk songs that I'd known before with the Beatles beat. Uh, things like, um, well, what later came out is Turn, Turn, Turn. <laughs> To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. Roger McGuinn very much came out of folk music. He was in the Limelighters. He was in some traditional groups. Uh, 
McGuinn came out of that, what was really important was that unlike a lot of folk music snobs, McGuinn heard the Beatles and said, this is the greatest, I gotta start a band too. But he brought a lot of folk music into it with him. Most obviously the 12 string guitar, which has in itself become a whole kind of subgenre. Uh, but McGuinn put things together in a, in a new way. And the fact that then it would work with Bob Dylan's lyrics, as a Mr. Tambourine Man, suddenly opened up a world of possibilities. I used a lot of my banjo technique on the guitar. Um, I started doing uh, this rolling thing. And that would be the uh, substructure of the song. It would be in the song. Like, and then I'd put lead lines over it, you know, like on Eight Miles High. Like, which was influenced by John Coltrane's saxophone work that I was very interested in. So I was trying to get the valves opening and closing with the 12 string. You know. If you want to get real small about it, there is a whole line that you can follow from the 60s to the present that came out of the birds. And then, you know, in the bigger sense, the birds become one more color that goes in and out of everything else. And a lot of people, you know, Springsteen or Jackson Brown or any number of people will have their one birdsy song. While the whole world seemed to tune into rock and roll in its various guises, the musicians themselves were inspired not only by blues, but by jazz virtuosos like John Coltrane and Wes Montgomery. Wes Montgomery was doing something different than any other guitar player. There was no one like Wes Montgomery, and he was influencing every guitar player on earth that heard him. He would automatically want to play octaves when you heard him play. That was his great contribution, the one that stuck out the most. But that had nothing to do with his musicianship. His musicianship was second to none. He would be compared to John Coltrane on saxophone. That, that's how innovative he was on this instrument and how his mastery of the instrument was, was equal to that. Well, I got exposed to Wes Montgomery uh, through my mom. She used to play uh, a lot of jazz uh, when I was growing up. And uh, when I was really getting into guitar, I noticed some of these records being played, you know. And uh, I really latched on to the fact that this, this sound that he had uh, with the octaves, playing the octaves, you know. He used to play sort of like this with his thumb, you know. Get a real nice sound. Really beautiful sound. And I guess, um, although I can't say that I really knew the good notes from the bad notes <laughs> back then. Um, it did sound really beautiful to me. In the late 60s, George Benson followed in Montgomery's footsteps to become a major jazz guitarist. George established himself, like Wes, as a great jazz player, as a great jazz virtuoso. And what he did was where Wes played octaves, George would put another note in the middle, and I don't know if I can do this, like... Well, that's like Wes. And then, so, George was, uh... Put that extra note in there, or... And then a little Errol Garner. George Benson used to drive us crazy. Came in here and really picked the guitars up and started to play without anybody telling him. I used to kick him out. One day, Wes Montgomery walked into the store and said, hey, that kid plays really good, Henry. He's really a good guitarist. I said, you really think so, Wes? He's great. I used to let him play after that. While jazz guitarists didn't take much notice of what their precocious rock and roll offspring were getting up to, one rock and roll guitarist was single-handedly changing our perception of the instrument. Jimi Hendrix was the first guitarist since Charlie Christian to so completely redefine the guitar. 
Through his mastery of technique and control of feedback, he created a whole new expressive guitar language. Hendrix just invented the world as far as guitarists go. Uh, you can't get past that. He was the biggest thing and he'll always be the biggest thing. And it isn't a matter of technique. You couldn't have the sort of technique that people have if Hendrix hadn't opened the door. This is almost like uh, contemporary music in a way. You listen to some contemporary classical music. I mean, it's, it's, it's far out. He was really something. I don't think there were a lot of people that were doing this kind of sliding and using it for playing melodies. And Jimmy had... I mean, that sounds like West Montgomery, doesn't it? <laughs> so the idea of... Um, I'm sure he heard, wow, that's beautiful. You can play octaves and you can play a melody and it sounds bigger than if you went, you know, which is what a lot of surf guitar was doing, very twangy. His style first shocked me. I'd already been playing guitar for three years by the time I heard the first notes of Purple Haze, you know, and that, that scared the hell out of me at that time. When Hendrix started doing that stuff, he sounded as avant-garde and as crazy as, as John Coltrane or something. By the time Hendrix was done, then the most extreme sort of both electronic and technical guitar innovations were accepted. And in that way, guitar, in, even in rock and roll, the guitar mutated way ahead of the rest of the instruments. If you went to a rock concert now and the drummer started playing something really avant-garde, the audience would get restless. If the bass of the piano started playing something truly avant-garde, the audience would get restless. They'd go out for popcorn. But the guitarist could do the craziest thing in the world, and people are going to stand up and cheer. died I decided um, that I was gonna try to be a guitar player as much as I could and um, that was a that was probably the, the biggest guitar moment because it was sort of mixed with uh, confusion and uh, and sadness but at the same time a sort of a, um, a feeling within me that I was making some sort of a bold uh, striking move the almost mutant offspring of Hendrix uh, the Satrianis and the Vise, and all these guys who are great, great players, and Van Halen's one of them. Um, I think I'll owe it to him for allowing the acceleration of that process. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix was a customer before he went to England. Worked with a group called Curtis Knight. Uh, Curtis Knight has been a customer and still comes in here all the time. He brought Hendrix in, said he's a good player. Uh, I opened up a chart account for him. He went to England, I hadn't seen him for eight months, nine months, I figured he was a deadbeat. Came back in, and I guess he had just about hit then. Came, paid his bill. He used to come in, I would say, approximately once a week. And when he was nobody, he used to just come in and buy, he had money. He used to just come in and buy guitars, buy guitars, buy effects, anything that was different he bought, any kind of a guitar. The 70s was a new world. Hendrix was dead and the guitar was no longer king as it jostled for space with the other instruments. Supergroups made concept albums and filled stadiums. New bands played around with the image and iconography of rock and roll. 
Those who wanted guitar music turned to players like John McLaughlin, who provided a bridge between jazz and rock. I actually think the 70s was more uh, interesting than the 60s. The 60s was nice because it was the beginning. You saw Jimi Hendrix and you saw these individuals, but in the 70s, uh, there were a lot of individuals that emerged, like players like John McLaughlin, uh, and, you know, many others that took the guitar to even another point. <laughs> When I was 11 years old, the guitar arrived in my hand and one of my brothers showed me this chord. And um, you, feel this, you feel the vibration in your body and it's, it's just a feeling to it. I don't know what it is, it's kind of inexplicable. It's, it's sensual, it's aesthetic, I don't know what it is. But from that moment on, uh, I, I fell in love with the guitar and uh, started to sleep with the guitar right away. That's how much I was infatuated with it. I don't sleep with the guitar anymore, but I'm still infatuated by the guitar. What we were playing was fast. It might have sounded fast, but it really wasn't. It was just, it was just a different way of playing, like, like John Coltrane. When he played the saxophone, he played a barrage of notes and people called it sheets of sound. That was his kind of little phrase they used to attach to him. And John especially played like that. Carl Train uh, invented this kind of thing with, uh, with these flurries of notes and he would, um, he would like uh, go through three or four chords uh, with, one, with one phrase, just like that. While McLaughlin steered a rock audience into more experimental territory, it was Led Zeppelin who continued to exploit the brutal immediacy of the guitar. It's really hard to talk about Led Zeppelin because they contained uh, both some of the most cartoony aspects of rock and roll uh, and certainly some of the most influential as it turns out, for better or worse. They also contained a real sense of power and mystery. And that's one of the things that makes it hard to figure. There's no doubt that Led Zeppelin inspired more horrible bands than anybody else has ever inspired. But the music that Led Zeppelin made actually seems to get better as time goes by. What Led Zeppelin inspired in the mid-70s was a reaction against rock music as spectacle. A new young audience, tired of living in the shadow of the 60s, wanted to reclaim rock and roll for themselves. They did it with guitars. interesting as kind of a way station and a place where a movement that was going this way toward more and more excess got turned in a totally different direction toward more economy and just never mind learning 749 chords can you think of something new to do with those same three that you've been using <laughs> You know, what was interesting about punk for the guitar in some ways is what grew out of it again. And the fact that the police or U2 or R.E.M. 
uh, to varying degrees grew out of the punk movement, and, and all seem to have the same sense of, well, we're gonna, we got to do something with the guitar, and we're smart enough and talented enough that we're going to find something original to do with it. But we can't quite bring ourselves to get up there and play that long extended solo because that's everything we're, we're against. I knew a lot of students who would just say like, what is this, some guy comes along and hits a couple of strings and makes all this beautiful music. But you, you know, you want to say, yeah, but that's what it's all about. It's, it's not about achieving, it's not a race. Um, we're not talking about jumping higher or running faster. We're really talking about the quality of the expression. But in spite of that, um, a lot of players said, uh, you know, to hell with that, I'm going to play exactly the way I want to play, you know. And thank God for that, so that's why we have Steve Vai and Eddie Van Halen and a lot of players like that. Van Halen, seen by many as the father of the 80s rock guitar, seemed to tap into something missed by punk and dance music, marrying virtuoso guitar playing with a flamboyant presence. His success sparked off a new wave of guitar bands who took much of their sound and visual identity from Led Zeppelin. The same kids who teenage generation after teenage generation kept discovering Led Zeppelin, since Led Zeppelin wasn't around anymore, kept looking for some local approximation of it. It sounds funny, but for every Let's say for every 10 guys who really are just um, uh, abusing themselves with the fretboard, there's at least one who is just working on a quicker level. The synapses are firing quicker or something. In this metal world, the guitar player consciously enjoys his mythic status and milks the guitar for all its sexual and pseudo-religious symbolism. But players like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, while inhabiting and exploiting this world, use their playing skills to explore other musical territory. Satriani will, when the kind of guitar smoke has cleared, will be viewed, and not only as a great guitarist, but as a person who opened the door for innovation in rock guitar playing. One thing, the importance of the fellas like, like Vi and Satriani uh, is that they sell and popularize a lot of the guitar. Most of the kids, most of the teenage boys who are taking guitar lessons today don't aspire to be B.B. King, and they don't particularly aspire to be The Edge. They aspire to be like Vian Satriani. Many of these young guitarists head for Los Angeles, the mecca of this new guitar age. And for those wanting to hothouse their way to that elusive record contract, a left off Hollywood Boulevard will bring them to the world's only guitar institute. One thing that's unique about this school is we are a player's school. And um, people come here to play all the time. You have your guitar in your hand 24 hours a day if you want. I think that the school is definitely prosperous being in Los Angeles because the industry is here. I mean, everything in the music industry, there is an office in Los Angeles. Given 
the contemporary music trend right now, uh, about 50% of it is rock, and then all other styles are pretty split evenly with jazz and fusion and R&B and pop. Whatever these students learn about diatonic scales or contractual small print, their dream will be to create a guitar moment that sends a shiver down people's spines. guitar, which is my collector's item, was the guitar that every amplifier in the store was tried out on in the old days. We never let them try a guitar over here. George Harrison came in one day and offered me $300 cash for it. This is the days it was selling for $45. If you ever interview him, ask about Manny's Yellow Dan Electro. Everybody used this guitar. And we just keep it here for keepsakes. It's a um, great memento of the old days. While in the 90s sees every form of guitar music thriving, the guitar itself has become a highly collectible item, traded at guitar shows like this one in Nashville. This is just a place where people can be passionately interested in the instruments uh, to the point where it's almost like dealing drugs. These things are addictive. Uh, guitars are not something that people really feel lukewarm about uh, to the point where anything of interest. What kind of national you got there? Excuse me, this is just too good. Okay. That's one of the most popular guitars ever made by Gibson. It's a 335. They've been making them for 30 years or more. And almost everybody who's anybody has played one from time to time. That's why you should want it. I like guitars. I just can't help myself. That kind of case alone just clues me that that's a tricone national. It's a type of case that comes with a round neck tricone, which right now we need. Like you ask me, what do I need? That's one of them. Anything that's got a lot of switches, a lot of pearl, a lot of useless nonsense on it, always is worth more than it should be. Because a lot of us are, are really not very mature, we're really not grown up, and we like toys. When Eric Clapton or another great player has a particular guitar, they may even give it a name. You don't hear about anybody naming their synthesizer, or you don't hear much about people naming their horn. They almost seem like the good instruments are alive. Guitar is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's, uh, it seems like there's no end to how many things you can create with just six strings. But there's a guy around the corner that just plays 10 times as much and 10 times better. So it's always, uh, it's always exciting to be around. Anybody picks up an instrument. I can walk into a music store and find a kid that high could scare the hell out of you. So you, you don't know what's out there until you take a walk. There really isn't any real new techniques that people do that haven't been done before. Some of the very early techniques 
that um, one would use on a stringed instrument, a guitar instrument, if some of the 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 source of that stuff has goes back to um, flamingo. I mean, even like a bass player that you don't mind if I play something to you. You know, even if you uh, like the popping bass thing, you know, which is. Well, if you take that and you, if you want to get really historic about it, you could go back to some Spanish guys that, you know, that were playing like this, you know, they were playing different notes, you know, like, uh, you know, that, you know, playing all that kind of stuff, you know, but it's still basically hands, you know, fingers, you know, not picks. This technique where they have, where they pull a, they pull the notes very quick. And this technique, in fact, has been been taken by the rock guitar players today. But they do it in, they use uh, very low action and steel strings, and they do this thing like Eddie Van Halen. You know, I can't do it. I wish I could. I really like it, but it's I think it's impossible in this kind of guitar, where they're pulling and they're hitting a note, and so they're able to get this this kind of speed that the flamenco guitar players have, have had, particularly since the, the advent of Sabicas and development that he made with the flamenco guitar and the flamenco guitar techniques. Uh, but it, that's an interesting point because uh, when I saw it even Helen the first time and he was doing this hammering pulling technique, in fact it's related to this in a distant way to the, this flamenco technique of pulling. The difference is that Eddie does it with 50 marshals. So, you know, the most, you know, a kid with the, with the, you know, who's a, you know, with the, just a mentality of, uh, of a peanut could see that and see that that's happening. You know, whereas with the flamingo, you have to really, when you see the, the great flamingo guitar players, you have to really watch, man. These guys do many things that just go by people. The idea of, of fretting, um, this is on here, um, goes back quite a bit. I don't know the whole history of it, um, but getting all sorts of notes out um, was something that I actually used uh, in a piece called uh, Midnight, which in my mind, it was my version of sort of a flamenco thing. I, I wrote a piece of music that um, really came from a sort of a Baroque style, and then I thought, well, if I could sort of make it sort of Spanish sounding, but not ever strum it or pick it, you know? So I came up with this thing here uh, called Midnight. On the guitar, you see every note that you can play. Begs you, it likes says, play me. You don't have to feed it much. <laughs> Give it six strings and everything is cool. <laughs> Nothing any different about this guitar. It's the man that plays it. The number one reason that guitar has been the number one instrument is because if you're good at it, you can get the girls. I can really feel sort of like Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley, like right back there, like when I'm playing. Right center with me uh, is Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page and guys like that, you know, because that's when I came of age and that's how I related in my life to, as well as just music. Charlie Christian didn't look around and, and see Black Sabbath, Metallica, and, and U2 and all these bands, and so he didn't have to think about that. Charlie Christian's main concern was, I hope the horn players the drummer and the piano player don't look at me with utter disdain, you know, when I try to solo. So behind those guys really was the flamenco and the classical tradition. Pero mira, también 
¿Es cierto que es la primera vez? Esto no lo he cogido yo nunca. No. Nunca, nunca. ¿Y yo no sé no? tocar esta, esta guitarra. No. Y, no, no sé. Pero una vez tocaste en mi guitarra en mi DM. Sí, ¿Eso es la pr primera la, vez? La única vez. Thank <laughs> you. 